Uh, hello, and thanks for join joining us. I have a great honor today to be with Professor Joseph Tainter. Hello, Professor. Uh, hello, good evening. Uh, you are an American anthropologist and historian. You've studied anthropology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, as well as in Northwestern University, where you've uh, received your PhD in 1975. Uh, since 2012, you've been a professor uh, at Utah State University. Uh, we're here today to mainly discuss uh, the work that you have published in 1988, The Collapse of Complex Societies, uh, which has become really a, a classical, a great piece of work which has made many people interested in those topics uh, reflect uh, with a very strong theory. Uh, again, it's a, thanks a lot for accepting my invitation. Uh, I, I'm sure a lot of our viewers who have followed your, your work are uh, uh, will surely appreciate. Um, perhaps uh, without further ado, uh, Professor, if you want to describe what the initial intention of your work was um, behind uh, researching the collapse of complex societies. Yes, I'm uh, happy to. Uh, I am by professional background an archaeologist. And within archaeology and history, there are a number of uh, what would be called the big problems that are continually debated, have always been debated, but never seem to find an adequate solution. One of these is why did past societies occasionally collapse? And this was a topic that interested me for some time. Uh, people were actually encouraging me to write about it, but I felt that I couldn't write about it until I had a solution, um, an explanation for collapse that I could propose. So in 1983, um, the answer came to me, a, a solution came to me. Uh, I was actually at the time working on something completely different, but it was an idea that simply popped into my head. So I sat down at that point and, and sketched out an outline of the book and then went to work on it. Uh, it, it took two to three years after that of a lot of library research, reading literature on past collapses, but also reading uh, literature on the concept of complexity in modern societies. And and so this uh, this has led to my more recent work in issues of sustainability today. Hmm. Okay. How was the book initially received? And also in, in retrospect, uh, the 30 years that have uh, followed, uh, what contribution do you think is made to academics? Uh, perhaps also some objections that you may have received uh, regarding your theses. In, initially, within archaeology, there were some who didn't seem to understand it, or let's say they were skeptical. Uh, but my hope was that at some point it would break out of the academic arena and make its way uh, to the public, which is <laughs> what has largely happened. Uh, the book seems to have become rather widely read. Hmm? Uh, it profiled in a number of sources. Uh, there was an article in the New York Times magazine, uh, I think a couple of years ago on it. And uh, I, I have um, an almost continual, my, well, my inbox is on, it always has messages from people wanting me to do interviews like this or just to talk about it or just to tell me that they've read it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, uh, you cover, uh, initially, a lot of um, how say, alternative theories, uh, alternative to yours, to explain uh, past collapses. In the book, you cover about two dozens, so about 25 uh, collapses of complex societies from the Maya civilization to the Roman Empire and smaller uh, civilizations. Um, there's about 10 other theories that you cover and explain how they're not satisfactory. We don't necessarily have time to go over each and every one of them, but a theory like just a huge catastrophe uh, is not satisfactory. So let's say a pandemic uh, or a volcano eruption wouldn't be enough to explain. Uh, you also have uh, something strong against mystical theories, which are a bit abstract, such as uh, you know, uh, decadence, or uh, the civilization has just become old and using biological metaphors to say, well, this civilization uh, had just come to the end of its life. And these are not satisfactory explanations. Um, can you perhaps, well, tell us your distinction on why some societies transform 
why while others just fail to transform and just collapse i'm not sure what you mean by transform if, mm -hmm. if you mean change or adapt or well, societies do this all the time now in in the record of human existence existence of our species which now we now know extends back about 300,000 years uh, for a very long time for for many many millennia until perhaps uh, the emergence of homo sapiens uh, in the northern hemisphere in Europe and and, and in Asia um, there's very little change uh, in human societies but that began that began to change oh I would say 40 to 50 thousand years ago. And since that time, there has been an accelerating pattern of change. This has especially been the case since the development of, uh, of, of agriculture in various parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Now, the most common explanation for collapse uh, it, it is that it occurs because of uh, ecological overshoot or depleting resources or a shortage of resources and so forth. Th this is the argument made, for example, by, by Jared Diamond and also by many, by many other authors. Uh, I've written reviews of this line of reasoning, specifically of Diamond's book. And what I have found in looking at the reviews is that there is really no good evidence for it. There is no case where you can demonstrate that a society collapsed because of the shortage of a resource. Uh, in, instead, what we have to look at is the question, how do societies change to solve problems? And does problem solving itself ever undercut a society's ability to continue? Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing, yeah, in, in some cases, to take the case of resource overshoot, some societies are successful in solving that problem uh, and some are, are not. Uh, as well as other problems that arise besides uh, resource shortages. Um, well, the center of your theory is the notion of decreasing marginal returns over complexity, uh, which is sort of, I guess, um, how to say, uh, I don't know if adaptation is the right but, term, but an adaptation of the economic notion of the law of diminishing returns. Uh, Perhaps if you can elaborate on this theory of decreasing marginal returns over investment in complexity. Yes, there are many definitions of what the word collapse means. It's a term in everyday use, so people have common sense understandings of it. Uh, in the academic realm, most people who use the term collapse do so without defining what it means. Um, so I, 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 I am careful to be explicit about what I mean by collapse. My right. focus throughout is on the evolution of complexity in human societies. And a collapse is the rapid simplification of a society, the rapid loss of an established level of social, political, and economic complexity. Mm -hmm. Which may... Be often uh, be accompanied with um, uh, a fall in population, yes, decrease in literacy, uh, decrease in cultural level, I guess. Yeah, so those are precisely some of the symptoms. There's, there's political dis disintegration, there's economic simplification, societal simplification. Um, societies tend to be reduced in territory to smaller size. And, and there are definite reductions in population in many cases. In fact, a loss of population often uh, in collapses seems to occur as a prelude to the political collapse. It's almost an early indicator of, um, of problems. Mm -hmm. um, is there evidence of a Seneca effect? Uh, let's say, the, uh, I think the, cite, the quote says something like, uh, the way to prosperity is slow, the way to ruin is rapid. Um, I, I may not have the right quote or word by word, but the idea being that uh, collapse is faster than growth. So it may be over the course of decades uh, follow, of collapse following centuries of uh, growth. Yes, yeah, so well, that's what the word means in English. It's, it's, it's a simplification that happens rapidly. Now, now, the term rapid, you have to identify it within the context of specific societies. There, there isn't a universal conception of 
what level of rapidity would constitute a collapse? You have to look at individual cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, perhaps, yeah, so if, you, if we get back to the explanation of these collapses, again, you have uh, two dozen cases that you uh, cover in your book, including uh, the, the Maya and the Roman Empire, uh, which are some of the most, let's say, spectacular uh, cases as they were quite large uh, civilizations. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll let you elaborate on the unifying theory that would explain uh, in many of these instances why those complex societies have collapsed. We have to focus on the concept of complexity. Mm -hmm. Now, with any knowledge of human history, let's say since the end of the last ice age, we know that human societies over large parts of the globe have seemed persistently to become more complex. But what I mean by complex is that there are more parts to the society. Now, these might be technologies, they might be social roles, they might be institutions, they might be places of settlement. All of these things are parts of a society that increase in number. And then also um, of complex societies more highly organized. Uh, in, in other words, there are constraints on how people and institutions behave so that the parts work together. So complexity, I say, consists of structure and organization. Structure means the, the, the number and arrangement and parts of a society and organization is how those parts are constrained to work together mm -hmm. to make a functioning system. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm guessing also complexity would relate also to the way information flows uh, across society and the way information uh, is organized. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. In information is an important component of complexity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in more complex societies, it's necessary to uh, gather and communicate and process more and more information. And, and, and so organs that a society has to process information together and process information themselves tend to grow and become more costly. Mm -hmm. so yeah. what we, the fundamental point to understand about complexity is that complexity isn't free. Complexity always has a metabolic cost. Mm -hmm. As a society increases in size, in population, the number of institutions, uh, in the activities that it can, that it engages in, each of these has an energy cost. Mm -hmm. And as you increase in complexity in a society, the energy cost of simply being that society tends to grow and grow. So I have argued that these initial investments in complexity to solve problems uh, are at first very productive. Uh, they yield a high return on investment. But over time, the simplest solutions tend to be adopted, and what remains are more difficult solutions, costlier solutions to problems. And so complexity as a strategy of solving problems reaches a point of diminishing returns. And when this happens, the society becomes to, starts to become economically weakened. Uh, it starts to become less capable of solving problems. And at time, these can precipitate a collapse. Mm. Can you perhaps clarify what you mean by energy because it, it may have a meaning in social sciences that's different from its meaning in physics which most of our viewers uh, are used to as, as engineers but what would you mean by uh, energy um, besides what we usually mean uh, oil coal gas uh, hydraulic etc but uh, I think it, it we mean something different uh, in social sciences okay it, it's very simple energy is the capacity to perform work that is the fundamental definition. Now, what matters for the study of history and for uh, understanding ourselves today is, is oh, energy as a quantity, but even more importantly, the sources of energy on which we rely. Mm -hmm. Now, a factor about our societies today is that people don't understand the complexity costs because complexity appears to be free. Mm -hmm. We pay for it with fossil fuels. Now, in the past, increasing the complexity of a society meant that people worked harder. Uh, mm -hmm. In, let's say, uh, an ancient society like the Roman Empire, uh, increasing the complexity of the Roman Empire meant that people had to pay higher taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, that, so the increasing complexity causes people to have to work harder. And um, this is a factor that can make a, a society 
vulnerable to, to being weakened and ultimately to collapsing. So th this is a fundamental distinction between societies of the past and societies today. That today, people don't understand that complexity has an energy cost, a metabolic cost, but it still does. We just pay mm -hmm. for it with, with fossil fuels. So uh, our only reckoning of the cost is, let's say, how much we pay um, for petrol to fill our cars. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll come back to the extent to which your theory would apply to modern days. But let's say um, in the 19th century, it wasn't that costly in terms of energy uh, to obtain uh, progress in health. So it was cleaner water, it was waste uh, collection, and for little cost, we gained uh, 10, 20 years of life expectancy, something like that. Uh, nowadays, we have to incur important costs just to avoid life expectancy to, to fall. And we we have much higher costs for gaining any year of life expectancy. I mean, am I sort of applying correctly what you, you, you mean to, to modern days? And I would go back a little farther in time than the 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the important factor, or, or one of two important factors in how we live today was, the, of course, the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it is part of the ideology, the belief system of uh, modern societies that we think we achieved the Industrial Revolution through ingenu ingenuity and hard work. And, of course, those were very important, but by themselves, they weren't sufficient. Uh, without shifting over time to a coal-based society and then to uh, a petrol petroleum-based society, uh, the Industrial Revolution could never have happened. Uh, if we look way back in time, the ancient empires, and, and again, the Roman Empire is a case I like to refer to, they had large-scale industrial methods of production, but it didn't raise anyone's standard of living. It was simply done to accomplish things that needed to be done. Uh, the, the example I, I, I often use is Uh, the production of coins in the Roman Empire. Uh, at, at one point in the fourth century, as far as I can do, for, can tell from uh, from the literature, the, the Roman Empire was producing as many as one million coins a day, every mm -hmm. day, day after day, year after year. It was an industrial scale of production, <clears throat> but it was something that needed to be done simply for the government to pay its bills, mainly to pay mm -hmm. the army. So uh, com complexity before the Industrial Revolution was a very different thing, and particularly complexity before fossil fuels was a very different thing. It's primarily the development of fossil fuels that allowed us to live the way we do today, to have modern health, uh, to have a consumer economy, uh, and, and so forth, all the things that, we're, that we know in how we live today. The, the important thing for, for people who aren't historians to understand is that This is a recent development uh, in, in, in human society. It's a recent development in human history. Um, people in the past did not innovate at high frequency levels like we do today. It's something that we do today, we are able to do today, very largely because of fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. uh, indeed, if we go delve further into the Roman Empire, um, I, I guess one way to ask it would be why has the Western Roman Empire collapsed while the Eastern Roman Empire has not collapsed? Yes, um, the problem with any empire uh, is that it can't expand forever. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the case of the Roman Empire, uh, if you look at the economic statistics that we do have for the empire, it becomes clear that um, by the beginning of Is, let's say the second century BC, the Romans were using their conquests of other people to pay for more conquests. Mm -hmm. In other words, subject people underwrote the costs of further expansion. Uh, so, for example, uh, in, in the second century BC, I think it was the, the Roman people eliminated taxation of themselves while continuing to tax everyone uh, who was a subject population. So th and this, this initially was how the Roma, uh, how Roman Empire was able to grow and expand by appropriating, uh, we could call it surplus energy uh, in, in the form of, of wealth uh, from people they had conquered. Now, this can, that can continue forever. Eventually, an empire runs out of profitable conquests. Uh, so by the beginning of um, the first century AD, Rome had reached this point mm -hmm. where it had It had reached what some people call natural boundaries, uh, which would be in Europe, would be the Rhine and the Danube, 
uh, in North Africa would be uh, the lands near the Mediterranean. In the Near East, um, the, the Levant, uh, the areas, you know, what are, what are now the nations of, let's say, Turkey, uh, Syria, Israel, um, Egypt was a major conquest for the empire. You know, Egypt was, was very desirable to have as a province for the Roman Empire, and the Romans guarded it very carefully. Uh, because it was enormously profitable, and it, it paid for a lot of the cost for being the Roman Empire. Um, so, so uh, the ability to bring in new wealth eventually comes to a halt because conquests can't go on forever. Uh, so, eventually, the Roman Empire had to sustain itself out of what I call annual solar energy. That is, it had to sustain itself on the basis of simple agriculture, uh, which is practiced everywhere around the Mediterranean at this time. And, and, and this was essentially a fixed amount um, in which farmers uh, would not normally be would not normally be looking to increase production unless they're forced to. Um, in other words, that they're forced to pay taxes. But this then became taxation then became the economic basis of the empire. Um, the problem is that uh, well, I should say the problem is problems. The problem is that challenges to any empire like the Roman Empire are inevitable. They happen. Challenges happen. Uh, particularly in the Roman Empire, in the third century AD, there was a prolonged crisis, a 50-year crisis, uh, in which there were repeated incursions by Germanic peoples across uh, the Rhine and the Danube. Uh, there were wars with... Uh, the Parthian Empire in the Near East, this is one of the successors of the ancient uh, Persian Empire. And there were continual civil wars in which um, generals in various provinces uh, tried to become emperor themselves. They engaged in a civil war and, and these went on uh, well, for about a 50 year period. And uh, be because of this, uh, the average rule of an emperor, an emperor in this period was actually only a few months. There was almost continual turnover, with the, with a couple of exceptions. Um, in the 260s, the empire actually broke up into three parts. Um, Gaul became an independent empire. Uh, the Near East became an independent empire. And the Roman Empire itself was reduced to Italy and, and the surrounding areas, uh, Spain, the Balkans, Greece, North Africa, and so forth. Uh, after the 270s, a series of reforming emperors came along who were able to reestablish the empire, and they did so to a substantial degree by increasing complexity. They increased the size and, and scope and cost of the government. Uh, what had been a small number of very large provinces were divided into a large number of small provinces, and this was the main solution to stopping the civil wars, that um, the territories that, let's say, an emperor or a general commanded were now much smaller and had more limited resources. But this also meant that every one of these small provinces had to have a, a government, a bureaucracy, its own military force, and so forth. Mm. Just in this sense, we see the complexity of the empire increasing. Um, the the, uh, the empire was forced to pay for all this, was forced to, um, to debase the silver currency. Uh, the silver currency, um, let's say in the early first century AD, was about 98% pure silver. And this was as good as they could make it technologically in those days. Mm -hmm. Beginning in the year 64, two things happened. One was a war in the Near East and the Great Fire of Rome. Uh, the emperor at the time, Nero, began uh, a process that proved to be a slippery slope. He debased the silver currency, reducing it from about 98 to about 90 percent silver. And mm -hmm. then this is a process that continued and continued and continued until about the year 268, when uh, the, con the silver content of, of what were supposed to be silver coins was reduced to about 2 percent silver. Mm -hmm. uh, at, at this point, uh, the reforming emperors... They reformed the army. Uh, one of the things they, they did was they increased the size of the army. Uh, and in fact, uh, there are data indicating that the army may have as much as doubled in size mm. from about 300,000 permanent troops to about 600,000. 
You know, the, the Roman Empire was the only state before modern times that kept a standing M, a standing army that was sufficient for everything. No other state tried to do this, and it was expensive. Soldiers had to be paid. They had to be billeted. Uh, the, to be empire, fed. the empire built roads uh, throughout the empire, very largely for military reasons. Um, you, you know, when they expanded into England in the north of England, they they built uh, the Hadrian's Wall and then the Antonine Wall. All of these things were very costly. Uh, another thing that happened was that uh, the army was divided between uh, static frontier troops and mobile um, infantry and cavalry in the interior. So, he, so here we see in, again an increase in complexity. Um, more parts, uh, a division between static frontier troops and mobile interior troops. And at the same time, uh, the proportion of cavalry in the army increased. Uh, as anyone who's kept a horse knows that they're very expensive. It's very expensive mm -hmm. to keep horses. Um, my mm -hmm. wife has always had one or two, uh, and, and, I, and I enjoy them. I'm happy to pay for them, but horses are expensive. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so this was yet another increase in the cost of being the Roman Empire. So basically what this meant is that the Roman Empire increased in size and complexity and costliness just to sustain itself. It cost more and more to be the Roman Empire, this is a clear case of diminishing returns to the cost of complexity. And in time, it, it weakened the empire militarily. It caused uh, the taxpaying farmers to become disaffected so that from time to time, some of them would break away. Uh, wealthy landowners would try to get out of paying their taxes. And, and over time, this, this weakened the empire and population began to decline. And, mm. and in the end, it was militarily unable to sustain itself. So... The conventional date for the end of the Roman Empire in the West is, is 476. But in fact, I would say the collapse occurred over a period of several de decades uh, in the middle of the 5th century AD. Right, right. Why did the empire in the East survive, the Eastern Roman Empire, right. uh, what we came to know as the Byzantine Empire? Well, it was simply, it, it was the parts of the Mediterranean that had been settled and farmed the longest. Uh, it was more developed economically. Uh, basically, it was simply wealthier than the Western Roman Empire. So when the empire split into two parts, West and East, which happened in 495, uh, or excuse me, 395 AD, uh, the East was better able to survive. Um, sometimes the East uh, would simply buy off the barbarians uh, and encourage them to go attack the West instead. Uh, the East faced a lot of challenges but it was able to sustain itself um, up until uh, the seventh century, and then that becomes a different issue to discuss. Right, right, right. So yeah, with this explanation, we can see that uh, a theory such as you know the empire just went uh, decadent and died out. Well, it, it's not satisfactory. Uh, also, the theory of barbarian invasions, which could be deemed more, more serious and uh, to be honest i think it's the main one we learned uh, at school in france <laughs> uh which is a shame because uh, the, the the explanation you provide is obviously more complete and also enables uh delving into all the notions such as complexity and energy that you have uh, uh exposed um but, so yeah so, intervene here because you, you make a good point about learning that the barbarians caused the fall of rome no the barbarians were a symptom of the existence mm -hmm. of the mere fact that the Roman Empire existed and appeared uh, to be wealthy to the people of Central Europe attracted them um, to the frontier, first of all, and then to want to be in the Roman Empire. They wanted to participate in the wealth. Yeah. Uh, a few years ago, I had an opportunity um, to go through uh, museums in the Scandinavian countries, and every, every museum in Sweden, uh, Denmark, Norway, every museum had... Um, had exhibits of what had been hordes of Roman coins that had been that had been found. And what I realized that from that, something I hadn't realized before, is that recruits from even as far north as Sweden were serving in the Roman army and, mm. and taking home good quality silver coins with them. Um, mm. So it, it's an example of how the Roman Empire attracted its own problems. Mm. Right, 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 right. Mm. Um, great. Well, uh, I don't know if, if we want to say anything additional about the Western Roman Empire. I mean, this was really complete uh, explanation and, and history. It's very clear. So the, 
Western Roman Empire collapsed and this region was set back, I don't know, centuries, uh, population was lost, there, there were diseases and, and, and wars, uh, loss of culture, um, loss of architecture and, and uh, ruins. Uh, and this region of the world took centuries to uh, reach, uh, again, an equivalent level of let's say, development uh, and wealth. Um, at the same time, so the, I guess uh, since then, um, Western society has not collapsed. <laughs> so for the last 1500 years, uh, Western society has not collapsed. So w without necessarily going into the whole history of the last uh, 15 centuries, how, how would you explain that uh, there has been no instances of collapse uh, since then? And also, it seems since the antiquity, uh, besides the collapse of, well, that's just a whole other world and continent, besides the collapse of the uh, Maya Empire, um, but on the Eurasian continent, there has been, uh, since the Western Roman Empire collapsed, there, there has been, uh, unless I'm wrong, you correct me if I'm wrong, but no instances of um, of collapse. So how how would you explain that, you know, it's the same with China and uh, Europe and uh, the Near East, that we haven't observed collapses for now, uh, 15 centuries. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Europe because I, I have um, done some writing about uh, the development of European warfare. I'll try to not to get too detailed in it, but, mm -hmm. but basically, um, let us say over the last 500 years or so, there was always war in Europe. Mm -hmm. European nations were always at war with each other. Um, they would cobble together alliances to fight someone else, um, and, and war was simply inevitable. And it consumed larger and larger segments of national economies. Uh, one statistic that's always stuck in my mind was that when Napoleon invaded Russia, something like one in four Frenchmen was in the army. Mm. And at the same time, another one in four was in the clergy. So that leaves only half the population to support the other half. Economically, it was very expensive. And, and I, have, I have written that when I look at statistics like that, I think, well, if there was ever a society that was prone to collapsing, it was Europe in, let's say, up until the uh, 17th and 18th centuries. Well, what happened after that? Well, um, Europeans got lucky. Basically, they got Europeans got lucky, and this includes my own ancestors, um, because over the o over the horizon, well, they developed you know, ocean-going ships, and then over the horizon, they found new lands that they could exploit. Certainly, gold and silver from uh, Central and South America, um, spices from the Orient, uh, vast new sources of wealth that they were able to take and channel into, into European economies. And then they got lucky again in the 18th century, they discovered coal. And was starting first in England and then expanding to other European countries. They, they, they discovered coal and that increasingly became the basis of economies and the basis of how we live today. So th this to me is why there was no collapse in Europe, although I think there was a risk of one. Hmm. Okay. Um, perhaps we can, yeah, again, delve into the thermo-industrial revolution, um, uh, fossil fuel and industry-based uh, civilization that is uh, ours today. And uh, with a particular acceleration since the 50s, which a uh, scholar like Will Stephen, uh, Will Stephen uh, has called the Great Acceleration. Um, what do you apply sort of, sorry, would, would your theory also apply to modern day uh, society or, or would you be more um, uh, cautious about that? Well, we, we are the most complex societies that have ever existed. Uh, right. In, in <laughs> so of course it applies the concept of complexity and complexity as an economic function, of course it applies today. But as I said before, a major difference is that we're unaware um, of complexity as an economic function because it, it looks like complexity is free. We pay for it through fossil fuels. Um, mm. But we know now that um, there are limits to how far we can um, sustain our societies on fossil fuels. I mean, we know about the problems of climate change. We know about uh, the problems of, of ultimate depletion of fossil fuels. Mm. What I like to focus on, along, along with other colleagues who work in energy, uh, is not, let's say, the gross amount of 
of fossil fuels still in, in the ground waiting for us to, to pump them out, but rather um, what's called energy return on investment. Yep. Uh, now, it, it takes energy to produce energy. And what matters, what, what, what matters most is what's the net profit on that? Now, in 1940, the United States produced um, oil and gas um, at, a net, at an energy profit of 100 to 1. Um, mm -hmm. So for every barrel of oil we would invest in finding and producing more oil, we got 100 barrels back. Now, there's a, te there's a technical acronym we use for this. It's EROI, mm -hmm. Energy Return on Investment. But it's not monetary investment. It's energy investment. So... In 1940, we produced oil and gas at an energy profit of 100 to 1. In the United States, now that's down, down to 15 to 1, and mm -hmm. it will continue to go down. So this is a challenge that we face. It's not actually running out of, let's say, oil. The, the problem is that the net mm -hmm. profit of producing oil is declining, and it will continue to decline. So in my mind, this is equal to climate change as a challenge to our future reliance on fossil fuels. So what will it take for us to make a transition? Well, historically, it takes 40 to 50 years for an energy transition. Mm -hmm. So how long will it take us? Um, well, I mean, there's talk now of maybe stabilizing the climate in the 2030s, maybe having most people drive electric cars by about the same time period and so forth. And, and maybe these time estimates will come to pass. Uh, in, in any event, to change our way of life, to a new, to a different energy source, it involves complete um, technological and economic transformation, and that then expands into transformation in other spheres of our society and our politics. I mean, the transformation is already causing political conflict in the United States, um, mm -hmm. and, and the, tra the transformation will continue, and it will continue to cause conflict, and then conflict itself imposes further costs uh, on the society, and conflict increases, causes complexity to increase. So no, this, the, the problem of complexity and return on investment in energy and return on investment in complexity that has not gone away. It still applies to us today, but we're largely unaware of it. Mm -hmm. If I may complete, these are matters on which I'm more used to uh, doing um, research and, and writing myself, though I'm not a, a scholar. That, uh, similar issues are posed with water, uh, whose energy cost is increasing because we have to dig um, ever deeper, we have to desalinate, uh, we have to transport water over increasingly long uh, distances, and since water is increasingly polluted, we have to spend increasing energy and also increasingly complex technology to clean the water and um, the energy investment necessary to obtain resources would also apply to metals whose whose um, concentration within the earth's crust is also declining because um, you know in, in early stages you go out and uh, just like for oil you get you you go exploit high concentration metals uh, and uh, as time passes you're left with uh, lower concentration metals so yeah the, uh, i'm guessing this energy investment necessary to have uh, resources applies across the board to many resources besides oil um yeah um uh, don't you think, well, um, a, a question I had was, um, we talked about information flows uh, earlier on and the cost of processing information. Uh, I don't know if you have a view, particular view on the internet, uh, because uh, sometimes I'm thinking if the internet hadn't existed, then we would just be overburdened with paper and bureaucracy and, and difficulty in, in, in processing information. And perhaps the internet has uh, unlocked uh, or, or at least um uh, let's say uh increased the return over complexity uh again um even now even though now uh, we have to incur costs in uh, securing the internet and in uh harnessing vast amounts of data and perhaps uh uh it's becoming increasingly costly uh, 20 or 30 years after the emergence of internet to 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 now handle this problem but but yeah i don't know if um you have a view on uh information in modern day society yes well it, it, given the examples that you just talked about uh, in, information technology has transformed our societies and our economies and it will continue to do so i think for several more decades and to a large extent there are positive benefits of that uh, for example you and i can talk and do this interview 
Um, it would not have been possible a number of years ago, a few years ago. But there are also costs. Um, there, there are people who produce statistics on, let's say, the amount of energy that's produced to mine bitcoins mm -hmm. are, for, are for more serious things. Um, that all of this has has, a, has a, a metabolic cost, an energy cost. So is there a net positive return to this? I, I think we're in a phase where there are increasing returns um, to our investments in complexity and, and, and our reliance on energy. But that won't last forever. Eventually, we will reach, let's say, a saturation point with information technology. Uh, and and then, um, th then the profitability of information technology will reach diminishing returns and be, you'll be, begin to become less profitable. I mean, this is, this is inevitable in every economic transformation. Mm -hmm. um, are there perhaps, besides energy and information technology, perhaps other domains that you would like to address? It, uh, it could be agriculture or health or whichever other domain where your theory may or may not apply. Yes, I'd, I'd like to address innovation, which is a topic that some colleagues and I have been working on um, over oh, the, the last about a dozen years, mm -hmm. 13, 14 years or so. Uh, one of the arguments about um, our future is that we don't really need to worry about resources. All we need are market economies and the price mechanism and government staying out of the way. And, and whenever a resource seems to be short, uh, the market will bring out solutions to that. Uh, through the process of innovation, either finding a new resource or finding new ways to use the old resource or finding uh, less expensive sources of, 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 of whatever the, the scarce resource is. So that there has long been an argument, which is conventional in economics, that, um, that, that there, actually the resources are never short. They're simply priced wrong. Um, and that all that matters is incentives to innovate and find new ways of using resources or new resources. I have thought for, well, since the 1980s, when I did the collapse book, that um, this is, that, that there's a, an implicit assumption in this argument, and it's an assumption that economists never acknowledge. I don't think they're even aware of it. And the argument is, is the problem of complexity. Um, innovation as we know it today began in the late 18th and 19th centuries, maybe even a little bit earlier, um, as largely the province of, let's say, lone wolf scholars. Um, you can cite people like Charles Darwin, Gregor Mendel, uh, mm -hmm. various others, who in, essentially invented new fields of science, new fields of endeavor and innovation, um, and, and revolutionized the world by doing so. The problem is that in, in problem solving through innovation also reaches a point of complexity and diminishing returns. Because we have a situation today where let's say um, if you open a journal like Science or Nature and, and look at the authors per paper, it takes a lot of authors to produce a research paper now. When I was um, finishing my PhD in the 1970s, you would open one of those journals and there might be one author per paper. You open it now and, and they're anywhere from three or four or five to 12, 20 authors on every given paper. Uh, this is a function of depleting the simple problems to solve, the simple research topics to address so that it takes more and more, more and more researchers um, to, to achieve a, a, a breakthrough, conceptual breakthrough or an innovation. Mm -hmm. So for a long time, I didn't know how to test this idea until um, I met a couple of, of people who work in the area, uh, a couple of colleagues who have um, a, a database of, of from the United States Patent Office. And we were able to use that to test this idea. Now, um, patents in the United States come 50% from overseas. Mm. So what this means is that it's not just American innovation that, that we were able to measure. We, we're measuring global innovation by this study. What we found is that the productivity of innovation, uh, our, data, our database begins in, I think, 1974. Um, the productivity of innovation over a 30-year period decline is, has declined and continues to decline. It's declined by over 20% in a 30-year period. Now, how do we measure, how do we measure productivity? <coughs> Excuse me. 
If, if, if you chart um, innovations over time relative to how many people are named in a patent, what you see is that it is taking more and more innovators to achieve something worth uh, filing a patent over, an, an, an innovation, a new idea that merits a patent. It takes more and more um, collaborators to do this. And mm. this reflects the fact that the complexity of the research enterprise has grown so that it more and more disciplines now have to collaborate together sure. to produce intellectual breakthrough or a marketable mm. product. Now, the converse of that uh, is what we call patents per author. Um, over the course, you know, the patents per author is the converse of authors per patent. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, I mean, some of my publications has graphs have, that will show this more clearly. Okay. But patents per author has decreased um, beginning at the start of our data set to, I think, the end of our data set was in 2012. And, and I say it has increased by, decreased by over 20%. So that the productivity of innovation is decreasing. So what does patents per author mean? Well, it's the same measure as is used for productivity in the economy per, as a whole. It's output per worker. Patents mm. per author is output per worker, which is how we measure productivity in the economy. So we, we have shown that, in fact, the productivity of innovation is declining. It's, it's hard to tell that from going online or into a uh, an electronic store, there are always new electronic widgets to buy, right. actually costing more and more to produce them. Mm. Uh, and, and so this is this is the reason why I am skeptical about innovation, uh, about the, the ability of innovation to solve our problems indefinitely into the future. I don't think it will be able to. What will happen mm -hmm. is that certain fields of investigation will be phased out, uh, certain areas um, will no longer be funded by appropriating bodies, I mean, parliament or the Congress or state legislatures. Um, they'll, no longer, they'll no longer be willing to, to fund certain areas of innovation as the costs increase and the output declines. So the, the cost of innovation is increasing uh, and, and the productivity of innovation is declining. Mm -hmm. And this will continue. Yeah, uh, I can't help comparing with, uh, you know, the uh, resources that were necessary for um, Louis Pasteur to invade, invent a vaccination or Alexander Fleming with penicillin with relatively limited means, they, they achieved uh, extremely significant uh, breakthroughs, whereas uh, today with very significant means, we achieve breakthroughs that are of uh, lesser extent and, and perhaps less uh, social utility. Uh, well, uh, great. Well, uh, I had just one before last question. My, my last question would be uh, advice that you would give to younger generations but, uh, in conclusion of, of, of all your insights. But uh, I guess one before last question would be your, your stance on the um, Club of Rome report. Um, among others, uh, written by um, Donella and Dennis Meadows, who uh, were uh, celebrating the 50th anniversary of this uh, report. Uh, so the Meadows couple, as well as uh, Jorgen Randers and William Behrens. Um, I'm guessing, would, would you object to their theory of overshoot? Do you think it can be complementary to yours? I would tend to see them as two complementary threats, I mean, two, two different threats, but uh, I guess it's an open question to you as to how you view the, their work. Um, well, I, I know Dennis Meadows. I met Danella Meadows once, uh, and unfortunately, of course, we've lost her. But I, I, I know Dennis Meadows, and, and he asked me once um, whether his idea about um, ultimate declining output um, in, in the mining sector was consistent with my ideas about complexity and diminishing mm -hmm. returns. And, and as he described it, I said, yes, those are those are consistent. They're describing the same process, increasing costs and, and less and less output. Uh, and and this, this is what will happen um, with the problem of resources becoming depleted. But what what the limits to growth study never really was able to to accomplish was to show uh, the limits of the innovation theory of, of economists and technological optimists that um, all we need is market forces and the price mechanism and innovation will always get us through what may seem to be shortages of resources. And this is why I undertook uh, the innovation research um, showing that in fact, 
uh, we will not be able to innovate forever the way we do today. Innovation grows costly and complex and, and produces diminishing returns. Hmm. Well, thank you very much for all your insights. And I'm guessing, well, the, we haven't necessarily shared uh, super optimistic perspectives here, but at the same time, we're trying to be lucid and analyze what uh, uh, history has uh, unveiled and uh, how it may, um, what we may uh, retain from it regarding our present day society. Perhaps, well, despite all that, what, what would be some advice that you would give to younger generation? I mean, uh, this is kind of the point also of your, the last chapter of your book where, uh, among other things, you refer to uh, uh, trends such as um, survivalist bunkers. I didn't think it would be a trend right from the 80s because uh, it's getting a bit trendy again here in France uh, within a minority. But indeed, there is this sentiment of uh, um, I, I must survive and I must protect myself and my family, etc., um, if we set that aside, uh, yeah, perhaps, I guess, any advice that you would give to confront uh, this world, which uh, some may think is uh, intimidating? There are a couple of things I would say, because I, I get that question a lot. I don't have a simple answer to it. But I once gave an interview to a couple of French journalists who asked me that question, and, and I gave them an answer that I realized it was out of idiomatic English. I don't know whether everyone will understand it. But I'll translate answer, if necessary. <laughs> okay. My answer is that we are a species that muddles through. That's mm -hmm. all we've ever done and all we ever will do. So to muddle through something means you find your way step by step without a plan. And, th and, and this is what I say humanity will continue to do for the foreseeable future. The other thing I would say to young people is that the first step is awareness. Be aware of the many problems we're facing today, certainly uh, fossil fuels and climate change. Um, you know, I hope more and more people become aware of the energy basis of complexity in our societies. And, and I, I, I do want to conclude by saying that complexity itself is not necessarily a bad thing. Complexity is either useful and affordable or it isn't. Uh, in the Roman Empire, it stopped being useful and affordable. Uh, we don't want to get to that point ourselves today. So with that, I will conclude. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. And again, uh, congratulations for uh, your academic career and uh, for, for your work. And uh, we thank you very much for that. My pleasure.